Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast. I am so pleased to bring to you today Sharon Banks Tarr, who has a master's in nursing. She has just recently left a position as a surveyor for facilities in Maryland, in healthcare facilities. And she has great interest in helping to identify and overcome some of the things that happen in long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities that result in injuries to patients. She is also a legal nurse consultant certified and works with attorneys and facilities on these issues as they affect the elderly. Sharon, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Pat, and good morning. It is a pleasure indeed to be on your show. I know that as a surveyor, you can go into a facility and be called in because of a complaint or an injury to a resident. Tell us about how often falls are occurring in facilities. Is this still an issue? Because I know we've put in a lot of things to try to prevent falls in the elderly, but tell us from your perspective, how much of an issue is this? Falls with injury remains uh, a significant issue. In fact, uh, one in four older adults over age 65 are falling every year, and it doesn't seem to be decreasing looking at national data that's collected by CMS and uh, JCO. And I wonder, is that one in four, does that include people who are at home as well as people who are in facilities, or is that just people in facilities? That's including the people that are in homes and facilities. However, that that statistic is still high in facilities, which is why uh, JACO has come up with, and CMS, a never event um, Mm-hmm. definition for false mm-hmm. injuries. One in four makes that sound like, you know, it's inevitable that you're going to fall at some point in your older years. Is that true? It is not true. And uh, from research and from the surveys that I've conducted, it's a mindset. So if one believes that someone is 65 or older and well, they're just going to fall, then that decreases the risk management and quality assurance kinds of activities that can be instituted to stop or decrease those events from happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My husband is 81 and I know that he is very fearful of falling. He doesn't have, uh, other than his age, he doesn't have significant risk factors, but among his um, compatriots, he hangs out with some of the guys that he went to college with in India. They talk about, oh, you know, you don't want to fall. If you fall, that's it. It's over. You know, you, your life's never going to be the same. I hear these conversations going on. You know, Pat, I don't want to fall. How much of that is a realistic concern? Is your life over if you fall? It is, it becomes a realistic concern for the person that's older, and it can be a self fulfilling prophecy. But in general, there are things that can be done, risk management kinds of things to prevent falling. And those things are uh, sometimes common sense is only common to those of us who have it, but lighting, <laughs> shoes, the great size of shoes, you can prevent it. It is not a eventuality and a fact. Okay. Well, I think it, it would be helpful if we explore that because. As legal nurse consultants, you know, one of the things attorneys come to us all the time is, is this a preventable fall? Could this incident have been prevented or the patient fell and nothing anyone did could have stopped that? Can you think of situations as a surveyor when you've gone into a facility and you've said, this fall wasn't preventable? 
what kind of clinical scenarios would lead you to that kind of conclusion? The concept of resident rights, participant rights. I have the right to make bad decisions. So if a patient is lucid, if they are fully aware of what they're doing and they insist on, I insist on getting up and it doesn't matter that uh, it's dark and I should make sure that the lights are on or I turn the night light on, I'm going to get up. Those kinds of falls, um, although we've had to, I as a surveyor have had to say that that was not something that could be necessarily prevented um, because people have the right to make bad decisions. But on the other hand, I have asked, well, could we have like a 10 minute meeting about this? What are some things that might have been uh, interventions that would not interfere with that person's right to make a bad decision? So for instance, the night lighting, sometimes the night light in the wall has been out. It's burned out and it hasn't been replaced. And what's your schedule? What's your schedule for replacing the lights? So that kind of, very rarely has it been um, from an investigative perspective, something that quality assurance or risk management might not have prevented. Okay, let's say that again. So very rarely is it something that risk management couldn't have prevented? In other yes. words, there are environmental factors that could have been addressed that were not addressed. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. With lots of words. Yes. Well, sometimes it takes my brain a few minutes to unpack what you've said and what other people have said. The environment is also a curious thing because nursing homes are the resident's home. And residents want to have their furniture and their, their stuff around them. How often does that pose a hazard for residents in terms of falls? Again, from the, the complaint statistical perspective, a significant amount of time. Uh, I've been in situations where uh, a client has brought their own furniture in. The furniture is all too big. It's too large for the room. Mm. Uh, hard to navigate around the bed. Uh, if you have a walker, you have to leave the walker between the bed and the nightstand and the chair. It's just an environmental increased risk. So yes, the environment and the kinds of things like furniture, rugs, lights um, are significant when it comes to falls that could be prevented. You know, while we're on the topic of beds, I've been curious, having not worked in a long-term care facility for many years, I'm curious about the, the concept of putting the mattress on the floor or a low bed very close to the floor under the theory that you can't fall out of bed that way. Do those beds reduce falls? They do, uh, especially in the... Um, memory care units mm -hmm. where a person's cognitive impairment is significant. The lowering the beds, having the mattresses actually on the floor. In fact, beds are now made so that it's not just a mattress on the floor, it's a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. And there's also a safety mat that is placed in front of, well, my experience has been the safety mat is placed in front of the bed so that when the resident falls out of bed, they're actually just rolling onto the mat. It's a fall, it's without injury, and it is indeed not preventable because of their level of cognitive impairment. And then for the staff who are needing to change sheets on that bed, does that bed come up or do they have to be down on their knees changing sheets? The majority that I've seen, the staff has to lower their bodies to the level of the bed. And in some instances, there are beds that elevate mm -hmm. and can be changed. Uh, but it's not common because it's 
amazing and interesting. A lot of cognitively impaired people are very astute about being able to accomplish things that they otherwise should not. So there's a pedal that's hidden, but you find it. You elevate the bed, you lay on it, you fall, and now we've defeated the purpose of a lowered bed. Got it. Let's talk about bed alarms, because that's another topic that is curious to me when I think about the concept of the alarm going off as the person is lifting his or her body off the mattress. Are those alarms effective? They are. Uh, In fact, I've asked to actually see a bed that wasn't occupied because my, my thought was the person is already falling. So Mm -hmm. How is that helpful? But instead, there's a one to two inch radius that where the fall is preventable. And the alarm starts not as you're actually in the midst of the point of no return. It gives the staff time to get to you to prevent the fall. And that assumes there's somebody close enough, right? Who indeed hears it. Are there false alarms when people can activate those alarms by shifting their position? Or does that alarm always mean that somebody's in the act of trying to get out of bed? According to staff that I've interviewed, there have been some false alarms, but the amount of false alarms does not outweigh the preventative um, action that has occurred. There's a significant decrease in falls in the facilities that are using those bed mm. alarm mattresses. And can residents figure out how to deactivate those alarms? They cannot. Oh, isn't that clever? Tell me about that. Uh, the alarm in and of itself is, um, and they vary. It depends on what company. Uh, the majority that I've seen plug into, it's kind of like an air mattress concept, and they're plugging in at the far end of the top or the bottom of the bed, Mm -hmm. such as that it's difficult to reach them. And then the sheets and bedding also provide um, a cover from the resident or client being able to say, oh, here's something, let me me see how it works or let me just unplug it just because it's it's there and I can do that. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we talked about the patient's right to make decisions that are against their own self best interest. When you are called in as a surveyor and there's been an injurious fall and there has been activities by the staff that led to that fall, there's liability, there's deviations from the standard of care. What are some of the common things that you have seen that contribute to those falls? Uh, Basically, as I had said, it's lighting, um, it's staffing, the actual amount of staff. Do you have enough people to make the rounds? It's been discovered that uh, Mr. Jones gets out of bed somewhere between two and seven in the morning. So should we not increase the uh, number of rounds, the times you go and visit to see whether or not he needs to go to the bathroom? Um, Looking at how people are eating. Uh, Some people are falling because they're having, they're drinking up until seven or eight at night. They go to bed at eight or 8.30 and they fall later in the night, but If you take fluid in, you're going to let fluid out. So these are some of the things that I've asked when doing interviews. Um, There's something as simple as when do we stop fluid intake because uh, a person is is going to go to bed. Balancing, walking, uh, there's a belief that just because you have a walker, that the walker will prevent falls. But if there's not been any training or if your cognition is such that you forget the walker, then where's the reminders to utilize um, the walkers? So there's 
there's physical, um, environmental issues. There's the actual flooring, um, rugs, rugs that are in disrepair, rugs that don't have anti-skid on the backs of them. Um, and as I had said, also the furniture, the furniture is just too big and there needs to be some compromise. This furniture, uh, we know you love it, but uh, can we not consider the fact that you can't navigate around your room? Mm -hmm. And you know, that's a subtle thing. Uh, I, we have a house in Florida. We bought new furniture for our house and the salesperson say, well, I wanna see the dimensions as we're planning what furniture to buy to furnish this house. And I thought, oh, I could get two dressers in this bedroom. And he looked at it and he said, no, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't, Pat. You can have one dresser. You can't have two. And I thought, oh, but it looks like it's going to be so big. Well, no, it's not. So I'm sure you've got the, the, the family members who are helping to move in and probably in many instances, laced with lots of emotional issues of we can't take care of mom and dad anymore. So we've got to put them into a nursing home and, oh, but let me keep my bed in my dresser. That's a part of me. All of that plays into the safety factors that are hard to predict. Yes. Hard to predict. And as you said, there's there's emotion that's attached to it. Some some people have wanted the bed because that's the bed that my husband and I were in. That's the bed my wife and I were in. And, and I don't want to give it up. Or families who I've been taught, I've been called. Um, facilities have given family members my phone number. You don't have the right to say what furniture my loved one can have in their room. And I tried to take the conversation back to, it's not about making decisions or telling you what you can have in the room, but can you look at it from your loved one's safety perspective? So if all of that is in the room, and I know room measurements and room dynamics are difficult to imagine sometimes, mm -hmm. but walk into the room as it is with the furniture that's there, and then imagine the bed being three or four inches wider the dressers uh, protruding out another two or three inches. And some of them have said, aha. Mm -hmm. Some of them, the family member has come in, they've kept the furniture, they've fallen. And then the issue is there was risk management, but you chose not to take that advice. So the fall occurred, yes, but the fall occurred because you had the right to make the decision to bring in the furniture. Mm -hmm. that's, that's sometimes been a difficult conversation to have. Oh, yeah. Because then there's some guilt yes. associated with us. Let's talk about what happens in falls with elderly people. What kinds of injuries have you seen as a surveyor that are most common? Most common are hip and head injuries. And those, uh, the hip fractures that result in um, a lot of additional cost in terms of rehab or inability to recover their same level of independence as it related to walking or being able to get in and out of bed by themselves. Um, the head injuries have, again, contributed to a change in mentation, uh, thinking, and decision-making as it relates to uh, being independent in your activities of daily living, walking, going to the bathroom, taking in your meals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know as nurses that some of these elderly people are on anticoagulation and it always gives me chills when I see cases involving people who are on anticoagulation for AFib and then they fall. Yes. And then there's bleeding and then it may be recognized and the fall may be reported or it may not be until the patient has cascaded down into a, a subdural hematoma or, or worse. 
Have you seen situations like that as a surveyor? I have. And again, from the risk management perspective, my question is always, now that this is um, at, a, at, a, at a level of investigation external to your facility, walk back with me what could have been done or what might have been done to prevent the fall. It's not an accusation. It's knowledge is important, but if you don't use it, then what good is it? The nursing care plan is not just an extra piece of work. If it's measurable, realistic, and individualized, it will truly help in prevention of this kind of injury. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something often that we look at, Sharon, after a fall, did the facility change the care plan? Then the second fall occurs and the third fall occurs and, and sometimes many more until ultimately that person has a significantly injurious fall. You knew the patient fell, you knew the risk factors were there. What did you do to change the plan of care? Maybe that person wasn't a one assist. Maybe that person needed two people to assist. Um, I would think that that analytical part of what you did as a surveyor is it's the same skills that legal nurse consultants need and they're looking at cases after the fact, which puts you in an ideal position as a legal nurse consultant with your background as a surveyor to help attorneys with long-term care cases and also to help facilities uh, beef up their risk management perspective so that they don't end up with being the target of a lawsuit. Yes. Yes. Well, as we take that step and we think about it, um, one of the big things that comes up in long-term care cases that I've looked at is the patient or the resident has fallen and the CNAs are petrified to say anything. They're going to get fired. They're going to get disciplined. They're going to get yelled at. They're going to be um, suspended or terminated. So why should they tell anybody? Because the resident looks like he's okay. What happens then from your perspective? Oftentimes, especially if the incident has resulted in significant injury, um, I've asked to actually talk to staff. First talk to um, administrative uh, folks and then with their permission, have a small meeting. You know, I, I don't have um, the authority to have a training session with you, but just, just a two, three minute question and answer. And those questions would be not for answer. I don't want you to answer me, but I would like you to ask, think about staffing did you have sufficient staff in order to address this fall, meaning addressing prevention of the fall? Did your staff have the training to be able to make the determination that more assistance was needed or that um, you shouldn't give fluids after six o'clock in the evening or seven, whatever the time is that proceeds going to bed by an hour. Um, and staff, if something happens, is there a philosophy that says punitive or, or is there a philosophy that says, this has happened, let's work to make sure it doesn't happen again by doing a analysis of the events proceeding. Mm -hmm. And that has been helpful in, in places who've listened and I've gone back or even better, they have actually reduced their falls. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. mm -hmm. That is such a delicate balancing act, isn't it? If you, yeah. have, if you have a, a CNA who clearly should not be in that role, who doesn't have the, the, the skills 
I mean, I could use any number of adjectives or nouns to, to fill in the rest of that sentence. Should not be in that environment, is not the right individual. And you don't want them taking care of additional residents and potentially injuring them. Then you've got the facility has liability if they keep them in that role. But if they don't keep them, then by the very act of getting rid of them, or terminating them after an incident, have they then upped the liability risk for themselves by terminating that person? It's not a well-phrased question. I was thinking well, it through as I was saying it. Are you following what I'm asking? I, I understood it. And okay. the answer is yes, there are um, there are instances where there are repeat falls and the injuries are escalated in terms of how injurious they are for residents. If you do a turnover of staff sufficiently enough, then you have no knowledge base about what has occurred. And if the facility does not engage in a training session, and the training session is not necessarily taking something from a textbook, reading it and answering the five questions, true or false. This particular person, what did we do on the shifts preceding, the hours preceding? What could we do differently? If the staff feel like they're participating in an educational event, the outcome of that educational event is that they are often better at making the assessment that this is a potential fall risk. I, I went to um, a place uh, more than once, but I'll say I went to a place where somebody was falling and they were falling because they were bending over to pick up things that were on the floor. And in a conversation, one of those two, three minute conversations, this is a generation that doesn't necessarily walk past things. If they see something that needs to be thrown away, they pick it up. So if this person has fallen and they've fallen more than once, and this time that I'm here with you is because there is an injury or a report from oftentimes family, uh, I'm able to deduce from a record review and interviews that the key event that happens preceding the fall is bending over to pick up something. So what time of day is there the likelihood of more uh, of that kind of thing being on the floor, whether it's a piece of paper and somebody raised their hand and said, um, after meals and just before we go to meals. So there was a dialogue. And at the end of that dialogue, the staff actually, actually came up with a solution, which was let's have maintenance come through before and after meals to make sure that our hallways are cleaned of these kinds of things. So people don't feel the need to bend over. That's something that just really stuck out for me mm. uh, in terms of these doing the interview in a safe space that says we want to learn from this. Uh, the other thing I've run into is uh, having a threshold. So if Mr. Smith falls, he's falling 10 times before you're going to investigate. What if the third fall is the head injury or the fractured hip? So should we wait for 10 falls or should we look at each fall from a risk management perspective? And again, in the facilities that I've gone to and returned, some of them have said to me, wow, we really look at our falls differently now. And we have significantly decreased falls in our facilities. And it's been a significant number. So, you know, like, I don't know, over two, 3,000 surveys and at least two, 300 of them saying to you, you know, it works to actually have a training session that's helpful as opposed to punitive. And can you tell our viewer how you've taken that knowledge now that you're finished surveying and 
are available to work with facilities to help reduce their injuries. I am now available through uh, Clarity Legal Nurse Consulting, and my contact information includes LinkedIn, and uh, my phone number is 800-398-3849. Okay, thank you. And this has been Pat Iyer and Sharon banks Tar speaking about falls in nursing homes, about some of the issues that you should consider as you're helping an attorney evaluate after the fact how a fall occurred. Sharon works with facilities to help them in their risk management programs to address those issues. So if you are working as a legal nurse consultant in a facility and you recognize that they need some help with risk management and may not be amenable to hearing it from you as a legal nurse consultant, you know what they say about experts. Anyone who's more than 50 miles away becomes the expert. Sharon has shown you she has deep, deep knowledge and is entitled to use that term to help avoid some of the situations that result in lawsuits. When you talk to plaintiff attorneys about this field that they're in, they will readily admit they would prefer to be less busy, that people were not getting injured. They weren't being killed. They weren't suffering the consequences that can occur in a healthcare environment. Their role is to help after the fact. And Sharon's role as a consultant is to look at what a facility can do to prevent those catastrophes that we hear about or we get involved in. Thank you so much, Sharon, for being on the show. I appreciate your knowledge. And thank you, Pat. Thanks again. You are welcome. And be sure for you who's listening to this program that you go to our website, podcast.legalnursebusiness.com and check out the bundles of podcasts that we have available. We find the best shows based on reactions and downloads and put them together in categories as a bundle and make those available for you so that you can request them. There is a workbook that goes along with the bundles that's a small additional charge that helps you make sure that as you're going through the material, you're getting those key points. And you can refer back to the transcripts in the bundles so that you can refer to key points that the speakers made as they were doing their shows. That's podcast.legalnursebusiness.com and look at that homepage and pick a bundle of podcasts. See you next week. Welcome to Legal Nurse Podcast. I'm Pat Iyer and I have with me Kamara Jackson. We have just talked about one of the most challenging OB populations and the many things that can go wrong with this population. Kamara, what were some of the key points that we covered in your podcast? So we covered today about some of the high risks in antepartum, such as preeclampsia, monitoring those patients, what happens and what the risks are with nurses, especially those being um, new nurses and being pulled off for orientation to care for patients, how important a supportive environment is to foster that safe care, as well as we talked about some of the standards of care with caring with women with preeclampsia. Be sure to come back and watch Kamara Jackson's podcast on preeclampsia. It is certainly a very high risk population. And in today's healthcare environment, with the new graduates coming into hospitals with shorter clinicals in school and shorter orientations once they get their jobs, the risks can multiply. Thanks so much. See you at that show. Thank you.